Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. It's wonderful to have Jason and Amon here today. Um, they have been working on a translation of Dao Te Ching. And it's, uh, you know, all of us are enormously grateful to them for doing the translation and walking us through it. So today I'm going to talk to both of them about the experience of doing the translation. Then the, everybody else gets to ask them question about the translation process. Then we will read out, you know, Jason is going to read out nine of his verses. Amon is going to read them again. And then we are going to have a general discussion. Okay, so that's the plan. So let me start with Jason. Jason, how, how, how come did you, you decided to do the translation in the first place? Well, actually, at the beginning, uh, well, I read the Tao Te Ching when I was uh, young, okay, in the teenager. Okay, I, I, I just read it, and I think, I, I thought I understand. And then I joined Shri Khan's um, meetup about Tao Te Ching. I just want to hear how foreigners talk about Tao Te Ching. So I listen and the translation, and then uh, uh, I, I, at the beginning, I started to think, aha, uh -huh, okay, that's so many different ways to translate and I can do my own way. So I start to, you know, uh, do it my own way. Then later on, I start to realize, you know, I should be a little bit more serious on that because I should not just pick up one sentence, one stanza and uh, say, oh, that's what it means. Oh, that's what it means the same as Buddhism's uh, teaching about emptiness. I don't think I should do that. Okay, uh, uh, that's why I start to work on that. And then when I start to work on that, I start to find out, you know, not only the English translation is not faithful to the original text, even for past 2000 years in the Chinese interpreter, nobody, I should not say nobody, but most of the famous uh, scholar, they just interpret what they learn from that. And probably nobody seriously in Chinese and also in the West, nobody seriously look at the, the text and they say, if they have a person who wrote this, what does he meant? Okay, who is the audience? At what situation he is talking about this? So this situation start to get into my mind. So I get the more and the more serious on that, and then uh, get the more and more. Uh, on the word, on the sentence. And then Amang joined, and then I start to interact with Amang. And Amang is different my in my background. He learned in the early time, but he is not familiar with, uh, from the outside point of view to look at. So I think that helped a lot. And then we start to work together and become one of my job. So I will stop here and I believe Amang have other things to talk about. Wonderful. Amon, what is your experience with the Tao and Tao Te Ching in particular? When did you learn uh, oh, to be able to do this kind of work? Go ahead. You want the biography again. Yeah. Um, first, thank you. I, I have to say thank you for hosting this. This is really wonderful. Thank you, Jason, for drawing me into this process. It's been great. Um, it's actually kind of what I wanted out of grad school <laughs> that I never got in grad school. But um, the thumbnail version is I kind of came to Taoism through the back door of just being introduced to sort of the zeitgeist of pan-Asian thought. I was in martial arts from the age of four. I've done Taekwondo, uh, Hapkido, Kendo, Judo, Tai Chi, Wing Chun, uh, there's a list. And there are concepts that keep coming forward in that. When I discovered Chinese medicine later as an adult because of an injury I sustained that stopped my martial arts career, um, I found that in studying that, so many of these ideas that had been just sort of floated about were clearly or much more clearly articulated and so now chi wasn't just this sort of vague notion it had a real concrete sort of meaning and actually many meanings and here's 32 different forms of it and what it so that got me interested in sort of the roots of these ideas which eventually led me to Taoism 
and led me to the Tao Te Ching specifically as anyone in the West who says, you got to study Taoism, that's where you're going to be pointed to is to the Tao Te Ching. It's treated as the inception point of Taoism. Um, I've been studying that now for 25 years, 26, 27. Oh my God. Um, it's been since the late nineties. And that was actually when I was ordained, uh, as a Taoist priest. And I've continued to study ever since. Um, and again, I'm not religious about being a Taoist priest. It's just one, one more thing in more letters after the name. Um, but that was my interest in the Tao Te Ching and Taoism in general. And I've picked up and studied many copies and looked at many copies. And in grad school, I got to work with a preeminent scholar in Taoism, a gentleman named Paul Crow, who is a professor up at Simon Fraser in Vancouver. He's brilliant. He's forgotten more about Taoism than I probably will ever learn. Um, has read the Da Zhang cover to cover, has the entire 12 about 100 volumes in his office. Um, but I never got this chance to sort of do a deep dive on just the Tao Te Ching. It was much more broad in my field of study. I came to the meetup because I saw that it was happening and I thought, this is right in my wheelhouse. I could be interested. And after just a couple of times, I really enjoyed what was happening. When Jason said he was doing his own translation, I was impressed. I, I think that's always a Herculean task because I've seen what goes into translation. And when he asked me to come on board, I initially thought, okay, proofreading, I'm happy to do, you know, but how much do you want me to offer? Um, and that's become more and more as the process has sort of gone on. I've, I've become more comfortable saying, I don't know if I agree with this. I'm curious why you're doing this. I, I have, and so we can sort of spar back and forth in a playful way that pr is producing one of the best translations I have encountered. Um, and so I'm grateful to be here. I'm grateful to be in this process and I'm grateful to get to contribute anything I can, but I have to reiterate again, this is his baby. He is doing all the heavy lifting because again, my Chinese is meh. It's baby so uh, baby <laughs> needs all kinds of support system for it to turn out turn out right so uh it's so wonderful uh thank you thank you amon so let's go into the details uh so jason when you start working on a particular verse how does it work what what, what do you actually do how do you proceed okay uh so before uh, i talk answer your question just answer the uh, the, the comment about the baby yes uh, but uh, the way i treat the baby is different i don't own the baby so basics the baby has to grow and belong to the society so that's the meaning of baby okay i just started take care of that and he has his own responsibility and everybody should sure. interact with the baby okay even it's my baby okay so wonderful no I, that's a very taoist you know that the baby belongs yeah. in nature and you interact yeah. with nature and grow as a result of that yeah so that's the first thing on that so the way i of, of course the way of uh, translation the method of translation evolved okay because right now we are on the 61 62 i've been more mature i've become developed as uh, 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 a standard uh, 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 a process to uh, so basics i will read in the pure chinese without anything just the text i look at and i try to understand okay in the fresh mind and then uh, separate in the different paragraph group them together and i start, try to think through okay totally in chinese avoid any english western thinking and see how it logically really makes sense because a lot of time you will see the conflicts between the beginning and the end. So I just look at the bill right now it's pretty good. Uh, when I was young in Taiwan, I will be considered not possible to study literature, uh, philosophy, uh, Chinese uh, uh, classic. The reason is I have very bad memory. So unlike most of the uh, Asian students, they memorize most of them, but I can't. 
Okay, so, but right now I have an advantage behind the internet. So everything I think about, I just Google it and I can find. So all the ancient uh, uh, reference, I can find it. So that's pretty my advantage on that. So the way I look at, I see, oh, that's what that mean. And then I start to look at uh, other Chinese commentary. Okay, see how they think about it. I just, you know, form a great idea. Then I start to work on the English. And the English part, usually I will see a lot. There's a pl plenty of English translation. So I look at how they use the word. And then because the, uh, the big challenge would be usually uh, would be the word to word, right? Chinese word, you want to find one English word to match one Chinese character. It's very, very difficult, but I just try and uh, try to do it and I try to put together, then I need to polish the word. I don't want to have uh, the sentence in Chinese only have a four character and in English, you have to write the three lines. So I try to make sure it's them and make sure the tone is correct. Okay, and uh, here comes uh, with Amang. Then I will send it to Amang. Amang will look at and uh, he will correct my grammar, suggest my uh, better words, and uh, then swap this word. And uh, because he understands Chinese character, he understands the real meaning of that. So that's the process we will do it and that I present. And usually I will see people's response. And when I read out, out loud to the group, I have a different feeling. Okay, so I say, oh, Okay, that may be not right. Okay, so something like this. So that, that's the process. And I really uh, appreciate if everybody hear the translation, if you disagree, you have a question, it's, I would be very, very happy if somebody tell me, hey, Jason, I don't think that's the right word. And does this word and this word conflict? Okay, I, I really would like to hear this kind of comment. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Jason. So Amon, when the when Jason sends the baby to your door and you find the baby at your door, what do you do to it? Um, well, before I answer your question, I want to uh, just say for from the start, um, one of the reasons I was willing to do this was I appreciate how difficult bilinguality is. And I want to say Jason's English is vastly superior to my Chinese, both spoken and certainly written because I am not very Chinese literate. Um, most of my learning was audio through commuting to, from Olympia to Kirkland, which is about a two hour drive. Um, however, because of that, when he sent it to me, my first instinct was, okay, so do you just want me to polish the English a bit to make sure that you're getting the right sentences, the right grammar, you know, those sort of things. And so at first, like he said, it's been an evolving process. At first, it was very much, let me just make sure, you know, the, the punctuation is correct, that the word selection is correct, the tense is right, you know, that it's consistent verb agreement, blah, blah, blah. And it evolved over time to where it's like, okay, it doesn't have to just be me doing sort of a proofread edit. I can actually do sort of a revision edit with him where I can look at what he's written and say, okay, this works. Um, but I usually then will take the text, copy it, and I'll go section by section and put in whatever suggestions I may have or edits I may suggest, and then try and add commentary why I'm making this suggestion or what I'm thinking at the, at, uh, about when I'm offering this idea. And then at the end, I'll try and sum up, you know, if there's any broader ideas or broader themes that I thought uh, were worth sort of drawing out more. It is really difficult to do what Jason's talking about going word by word, because as my old uh, master liked to say, Chinese language likes to take a universe of meaning and package it into the smallest possible particle possible. And then let you dig at that one word for years and, years and years and years and years and years to try and extract all the depth and meaning that you can possibly extract from it. Um, my the Sifu I'm talking about is a gentleman named uh, Chu Liang Al Huang, who 
is actually was a contemporary of Alan Watts. They together wrote the Watercourse Way. Um, he's quite a character. Um, I have infinite admiration for that man, but he taught me how to take Chinese words and not just take the face value, you know, dig a little deeper, look at the etymology, look at what the character is evoking when it's put there? What is it trying to get you to feel? Because that is something very unique about a language with pictographic history is that it's an image, it's a picture. And we, pictures are evocative to the human imagination. They are meant to make you see something and go, oh, I feel that way. Or I've, And we've all had that, whether it's Van Gogh or the Mona Lisa or any piece of you know, art image so when I take Jason's translation and he delivers it, I look at it very closely first to make sure, does this read clearly as English? And is everything, all the T's and I's dotted and crossed? But then I also look, okay, with this word choice, is this the word choice that works best here? And often now Jason will also, in the email, he'll send to me, I got this word, I'm considering this, this, and maybe even a sentence to, you know, get a meaning. And then I will dive into the thesaurus for, is there a good English word that, if it doesn't get it entirely, encapsulates enough of it that it works, it works on its own. So that's kind of my process when I get the chapters and get to go over them. This was an interesting weekend because I got the slew of nine chapters and it was just, you know, rough quick slap dash we we didn't do this process until i want to say around chapter eight or nine when i started participating so the first few we haven't really done that sort of a deep dive with before and just at a glance i i'm going through doing some quick edits looking at them and sending them back i was like wow these are really good these these absolutely hold together really well and i didn't have a lot to like because like Jason said, we both gotten better at this over time. And he said he'd gone back and sort of revamped his first few and they feel more consistent now. So that's, that's kind of my participation in, you know, this child rearing. Wonderful. Uh, back to you, Jason. Um, when you look at the more mature translations, the, the recent translations, when you've gotten all of this worked out, and when you look at the translation and compare it to other translations out there, how do you how do you think? What 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 is it that distinguishes your translation? How is it different from the rest? You mean from the rest? You mean other interpretations? Other other translations, both in Chinese and in English. Okay, I would say uh, we are doing totally different thing. Okay, it's not apple to apple comparison. Just like I talked to Dana White. Okay. Mm -hmm situation, we are in the two end. He yes. did his best to exhaust, explain, interpret what's the deep meaning of that. And then of course, a lot of his personal experience, his philosophy were put in. I would say it's rich, beautiful writing. Okay, he's on this end, okay. And I'm on the very, very faithful dying in the world, almost like a technical world. Okay, so one thing I worry is my translation will be very dry, okay, and very uh, technical writing. So that's one thing I'm worried you know, about uh, my translation. So it's probably, uh, so my, the goal I'm setting is I read it in Chinese, in the ancient Chinese uh, uh, text. And I want anybody, okay, like a shrinker, read my translation, get sort of the same feeling, okay, when uh, I read in the ancient Chinese, and then you as a person can interpret, okay, that's the teaching about, that's what I can learn when I deal with uh, my neighbor, okay. So I think that that's my purpose, you know. Okay. Uh, I'm on the same question to you, when you read the finished product, of the last few translations and compare it to you, you're familiar with many, 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 many translations. How, where would you put them? How would you characterize? Very faithful. I, I would call it a very faithful translation. Um, and I do, I think that's what Jason's talking about. And 
It's not dry or technical. I, I certainly wouldn't say it reads like, you know, a, a, an oven manual or, or operator's manual or anything like that. The words themselves, the text itself is beautiful and evocative and creative. And it, it a lot of what people are drawn to just pops right off the page, no matter how in how much you want to elaborate it or how closely you stay to what was originally there. It is difficult to make that sort of, like I said, one-to-one -one trade off because even the opening chapter, chapter one, the, the first six, the first six words, Dao Ke Dao, Fei Cheng Dao, have been translated in so many different ways to mean, you know, the Tao that can be said is not the eternal Tao. The Tao that can be doubted is not the real Tao. The way that can be weighed is not the way. There are so many opportunities to torque the language in such a way that you are trying to express how you read it the first time. And I think that's the trap almost every interpreter gets into is that they read the text it speaks to them and then they're they when they go to translate or or write a version it's almost impossible to not say well this is what it means because this is what it means to me when i hear dao ke dao fei cheng dao. um and if you don't actually speak chinese you don't know you know the connotation of a word even like dao where it can mean to say but that nominally could also be a lesson, but it can also be a footpath or a direction. Um, there, there's many different layers there. And so it's probably the most famous pun in history, that very opening line in Chinese. In English, that's lost a little bit. You, you don't get the pun necessarily. But when I'm looking at that finished product, what I'm looking at is, does some of that get through and at the same time is the translation he's choosing to use very faithful to what is there he's very good at being very faithful if anything i feel like sometimes i'm tweaking things to try and just get out some of the what it denotes not not the connotation um or i'm tweaking suggestions that way but i think that Jason's is probably a a graduate level translation that I have every intention when we're done to send to my old prop and say, hey, you gave me, you know, Ryden's copy of the Tao Te Ching as the go to translation. Tell me what you think of this, because I think this is pretty, pretty darn faithful, too. And, you know, when the experts weigh in because I need more of that in my life. Um, <laughs> I'll see if my impression is verified or not. Wonderful. And even if it's not validated by, you know, the old stuffy tweed jackets in British Columbia, I still think it's probably faithful. Wonderful. Uh, folks, I'm going to ask one last question to Jason and Amon, and then I'm going to invite you uh, to talk about what you are getting from Jason's translations. You know, you've been listening to Jason's translations. You've been hearing Jason and Amon explain why the translation is the way it is. And I would like you to talk about what you're getting from it, okay? Um, after the last uh, question. So Jason, the last question is that after doing the translation, after getting Amon's feedback, incorporating that, you present it at our meetup. And you have this entire conversation. We have this entire conversation on a verse. What do you get from, because you already put a lot of work on that verse. Typically, what do you get from the meetup after you've done this work? Jason. Uh, <clears throat> Usually, I would really appreciate when people express okay, how they read it, either from my translation or from other uh, interpreter. OK, 
Okay. So this kind of the rawness, the first impression is very important. You will see because the word, every word, every sentence is multi-dimension. So you look at the word, for example, a cup here. Okay. I may direct the link to coffee, but somebody may direct the link to fragile. Okay. So I think that people have a different uh, idea on that. So sometimes I will find out the words is missing, the meaning is missing, and uh, you will, it will help me to rethink, okay, what's the right thing, or they probably have some angle I miss. So basics, uh, that's a old, I think sit down and uh, translate and present, read out, out, read out loud, aloud to the group. You have a different meaning, okay? Actually, I didn't experience before. That's the first time in my life. So I feel like, for example, I finished this one and I probably read in home by myself. But when I read the group and I see people's face and that give me different feeling. And I think I can tell, okay? Uh, uh, am, I, um, am I moving in the... I should not say right direction or the wrong direction. I will say uh, verify is the direction I want to go. Okay, I think that would be the right word. Yeah. And before I end, I'd like to talk about something very challenging in the translation, Thanks. the ancient Chinese text. Uh, when you see a word, you don't know it's noun, it's a verb, okay, it's an adjective, or, you know, you don't know, okay, that's the first thing you have to figure out. And if it decides a verb, you don't know it's active or passive, okay, you say hit, da. you don't know I mean being hit, hidden, or, or I hit somebody, okay, so you don't know. And there's no subject, okay, when you say hit, I don't know, you know, the, I hit somebody or say you, or, the, sometimes they let go of this one. There's no tense, no past, no present, no future, and there, there's no punctuation. So you can break in any way you want to do. So that's the challenge uh, I'm facing technically. Okay, so yeah. Wonderful. Um, same question to you, Aman. What do you get from the meetup after you've, you know, you have a lot of experience with this text, you worked on this uh, translation. What happens during the meetup for you? Uh, I, be, I become such a bad Taoist. I, 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 <laughs> it tells you those who know don't speak. And I feel like I just can ramble <laughs> on forever. Um, <laughs> but apart from, you know, I, my I personal... strongly object to you rambling on. You, <laughs> you've always said things in less deeper things in smaller number of words than most people. So thank you. Go ahead. There was no one on my thesis defense committee who would agree with that statement. <laughs> um, however, uh, uh, besides my personal diminishment, I get the chance to see this live. Um, like Jason was saying, it, you sit and you read it alone and something is missing. And one of my favorite linguists once actually pointed that one of the flaws of writing is that it misses two fundamental components of human communication context and tone you don't get that when you are reading something it is done without a tone and without context and you fabricate that in your own mind if at all when you're reading when you're actually um orating in front of a group and getting that feedback now there's a context and this is an amazing context to sort of see this done in a forum. It feels very, you know, Plato at the Academy in some ways. And the tone really comes through in that you're getting that feedback of communication. How did people hear this and what did they take from it? And a lot of the discussion is sort of teasing that out. And when I'm engaged with the group listening to it, oftentimes I hear somebody's take on the text and it may not be because of a discrepancy in word or literary, but something in tone that speaks to them in a different way than it ever had to me. And it opened my, it opens my eyes to say, oh, that's another way of looking at this. Um, you know, Taoism, and I'm 
always reluctant to say it this for all Taoists, but Taoism does seem to all agree that real learning doesn't happen in words, but that's all we've got. And, and understanding that is kind of challenging. I can't through articulation in any way make you know the experience I have of my favorite meal. The, the favorite meal that comes to my mind, I could talk about it, I could pontificate, but I, I can't have you know the same way I do, why it is my favorite meal. That is outside the use of language to capture. Poetry points you there. It starts getting you there. Art is meant to be evocative in this way. And when we have this conversation, I feel like there's a better under, I, I'm closer to understanding somebody else's happy meal than just my own version of it. That's a terrible metaphor, but I'll, I'll stand by it nonetheless. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you, Amon. Uh, folks, now is the time. So we're going to first talk. Uh, I'm going to invite everybody to talk about what they are getting from this translation. Okay. So we'll just feedback first. Go ahead and type exclamation mark or raise your hand in Zoom in order to talk about what you're getting from uh, Jason and Amon's translation. That's number one. And once we are done with that, you can ask questions about the translations. First, just comments about the translation, what you're getting from it. And then we're going to do questions. Uh, we're going to start with uh, David, followed by Joe. David. Yeah, thanks, Yukon. And Jason and Amon, it's been a wonderful voyage. Uh, and I admit I haven't been to, uh, oh, in my... Uh, uh, go ahead, Dave. Dave, go ahead. There, you, you. Uh, there are multiple Davids. I didn't recognize and that. So go, go ahead, Dave. David, with the cat. Yeah, pardon me, David. I'm sure we'll get to you. But a request, because what I've really gotten out of it is the appreciation of how much real, really, this is poetry. And because when we see a translation in English, we're just getting English sentence, English sentence, English sentence. And then, Jason, when you put your worksheets up and it's four characters, four characters, four characters, I see structure. And then you've highlighted what I've seen called the, the focus word, you know, that's in red or whatever, that's in position two of every one of these. And so I'm starting to see that there's really structure there. And I think of, you know, American or English poetry is typically eight syllables in four lines and the ending syllables rhyme. For example, Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king horses and all the king men couldn't put Humpty back together again. And structure and rhythm. And of course, I hate it because now people just, well, I'm just going to write out, I and mean, we call it free verse. They write out anything and they call it poetry. But what I would like you to do because, uh, you know, we're not going to understand the uh, characters, but if you could read all four, four characters, for example, let me just let, use letters, A, B, C, D, A, B, C, E, A, B, C, F, A, B, C, G. And if you read it that way, we would see the po this poetic structure and it, it would help us understand. And especially the focus word. I remember one of the recent ones, the focus word was very. A pretty simple word, but why did the poet pick that particular word and put it in every line? It, to me, that's really a big idea about what he's where he's coming from, what he's trying to accomplish. But anyway, great work, guys, and I hope I can see a lot of these more of these. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dave. Um, folks, uh, so uh, feedback on the on the translations. It's going to be David Adelson, Joe Evanique, and Brian. David. Yes, thanks for coming, and, and thanks, uh, Amon and, and Jason. I mean, this is uh, you know wonderful insight and great questions from Srikant. I mean, and uh, I think that the things that have really struck for me is, I mean, one following on Dave is the the, the structure that Jason has presented to really understand the relationship between the the, the stanzas and especially sort of the the matrices or these tables that are inherent in there. Um, another is these the words themselves, I and mean, getting this very these, and, and I think that Jason is both 
Um, well, I'm getting two pieces. I mean, one of the yes is very technical. I think it's very helpful to, to understand this directly, the words um, as, as much as we can understand what the original author meant, um, was trying to say in the ancient Chinese, but also this um, you know, understanding the historical context, understanding the geographic context, um, and especially understanding um, or is it explaining more about why, you know, why these words are functioning the way they are. I mean, how they're, they're fitting together. Um, and uh, I mean, where he's giving some more interpretation, especially some of this, I mean, again, understanding the philosophy of you know, Confucianism, doing these, these additional comparisons and understanding of, I mean, especially Amman, I mean, and Jason both given these great understandings of, okay, moon, sun, I mean, all these, as you're saying, there's so many things to unpack in the Chinese characters and without, and, and even in the translations that we've heard, you know, read from some other great people, um, you know, they don't provide that unpacking of the Chinese characters. Okay, here is the the superficial or the you know the basic understanding of what these characters mean. But here is this entire additional understanding of to a, a, a native Chinese person or or of you know agriculturalism of you know. So there's you know that's what I'm finding really really helpful in the conversations. Yes, the translation itself is really helpful, but getting these um, helping to peel back these multiple layers. Um, which I don't think any of the translations uh, that, that, that I've seen at least you know, do that and to, to understand all these contexts. And as we've talked about multiple times, this is, you know, we said that this is instruction to the nobility I and mean, to think about it from these different audiences. That's what I think is really so special about this event. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, next up is going to be Joe followed by Evanique. Joe. Hi, guys. Um, it is... Uh... It's, it's quite an honor for, you know, just to, to, you know, to be able to host with you guys every week. And, and it really is something that uh, I really look forward to. And I mean, it's just, we're, we're benefiting from on so many lo levels. Uh, if, you know, what, with the translation though, uh, what was really interesting to me is that every time we go through the translation, Jason's translation, and we all read ours, you start to see the liberties that were taken by the author. And then you start to see the, where the authors are, you know, how they thought about the Tao Te Ching. So we have like an in-depth knowledge of what the authors are saying and what was actually said. And that's the most important part about that, you know, the, having such a literal translation. So one of the thing, one of the authors, uh, and 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 um, has said, you know, he, he's one of his favorite authors as well, uh, was uh, Stephen Met Mitchell, and I remember one in particular that we were going over, and 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 Jason's like, that's just not what it says. That's just it's that is you know that is that is pretty far off, and that's fine. But what it does is it starts to show the difference between what was actually said and then what people interpreted. And that's so important because then you can provide your own interpretation as well. Like you can kind of arrive at your own conclusions. So it's not only the we're looking at the interpretation that speaks to us by you know, incorporating the actual interpretation and learning in that process, it, it, there's no better way to do it as far as I'm concerned. Uh, there really isn't. So I, I you know, I appreciate it. Uh, I, I appreciate you guys more than you'll ever know. Um, but that, that, that part of it is really what makes us, I think, this meetup unique. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Next up is Evanique, Brian Allenby, and Katie. Evanique. Yeah, I uh, just want to echo what everyone said. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Aman, for the work that you do on this. I think um, everybody pretty much said what I was going to say, uh, but I do appreciate especially the word-to-word -word translation and seeing it against interpretations. And you can see where, like Joe said, people take liberties. And, you know, um, being a new student of Dao De Jing, it really helps to know the cultural background for the translations and 
the history behind it and why it, and, you know, really taking it from Chinese directly to English and hearing Jason and Iman translate that, it's just amazing. And even knowing what the Chinese characters are about, I've never studied Chinese, but um, when you translate, when you say what the characters mean, it brings something like it, it, it sparks your imagination. So it really helps me to know more what the Tao is talking about. And I appreciate when Jason says that most of our tr translations are off because then you know, like he's like, I know Jason's translating directly from Chinese. And I think I love that Jason and Amon both let other people who know Chinese in on the translation and have their say too. So that way they're not saying that they're a hundred percent right but they're allowing other people that also know the Chinese language that says that that may be a little off. And I love the discussion behind that because you can see it's like reading English and people having a different interpretation of the English word. So I, I just, I appreciate all the work that you both do. And so thank you. Wonderful uh, folks. Um, the um, people who just came in, uh, what we're doing is we're giving feedback to uh, Jason and Amon about what we are getting from their translation. Uh, give me just a second here. Um, okay, next up is going to be uh, Brian Allenby followed by Katie. Brian. Okay, first of all, um, I just sort of like to say that it's, it's an incredible series. Um, um, it, it's a real pleasure to be able to follow this. Um, the second point I would make is that everyone that has spoken before me, I will just say ditto, um, because a lot of the points are the same. My biggest point, I think, on all of that is that over the years, I've read many different translations um, with very limited understanding um, of any from, from all of them. To go through it in this depth with the expertise that we have is incredible. Um, one thing which springs to mind, I think, a little bit, is many of the different translations I have read are so different, I cannot imagine they're all coming from the same source. But here, I don't know if we're going back to the original source, but at least we're going back to Chinese, and it must be closer than many of the other ones that are translating from other people's work in English. So I, I really put a lot of faith in this and look forward to the rest of the series. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Uh, it's going to be Katie and Brian Nelson, and then uh, we're going to open it up to questions people may have about the translation uh, process itself. Katie. Um, adding on and echoing uh, what was said before, I think like with the Stephen Mitchell, I was gonna make the same point. I think it's because he doesn't speak Chinese. So having Jason as a native speaker, I think that's what, like a big lesson I learned is also, even if I don't, is to look back to the original source and the, and the translation of the words. I also think it, um, my second point is that um, I feel like the, the audience is pretty narrow, like it's, it's, it's advice giving to rulers and it's fun to kind of liberalize it and apply it to our own lives. I, I, I find that fun to do in text, not just to, uh, and then kind of on my spiritual journey, it's been interesting to see, um, to think about intelligent design, like the order in the universe, like the phases of a moon and, and then the you know phases in, in people and nature. It's, it's just quite interesting to think about it as a, you know, as a thought, as a, I don't know what the word would be, but some design. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Next up is going to be Brian. Brian Nelson. So I'm also uh, very, very grateful. I feel so fortunate to be involved in this. The, uh, of course, I need to, I want to say Shri Khan, having set up this format, everyone else who comes and contributes, I get a lot out of what everyone says. But honestly, the hearing the, the disciplined focus from the from Jason and Amon uh, really helps me understand 
it's it's kind of for me the thread that runs through the uh, all of the different translations and interpretations. For example, I like what Dana when Dana White was reading his and you know that is a very thoughtful interpretation and sometimes I think wow that's exactly the way if I were you know if I were able to speak eloquently on these points that's the way I would put it. But then uh, I realize it's more of an interpretation and I like the discipline of coming to the text, remembering the context. Um, sometimes I think I'm really not, uh, you know, how can I be so lucky to get this? I feel like I'm not worthy. It's such a rich experience. So I thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. So um, I, for me, uh, I think this is it's very special, uh, Jason and Amon. Uh, so firstly, I, I know that it is actually very hard to, to grasp another culture that is so different from yours at another time. So it's, it's enormously hard to grasp anything, even if it was in the same language. Um, I started out with translations which try to do like a, in, in Indian, there is a, there are two words for translation. One is Bhav Pradhan and one is Shabda Pradhan. Bhav Pradhan means one that is trying to get the gist right of the whole thing. And one which is trying to get the individual words right. So initially I started out with the Bhav Pradhan, which is like uh, the Ursula Lagwin for me was one of the best ones, which kind of captures the, the flow of thought pretty well. So I've kind of focused on that knowing fully well that my capacity of actually engaging the Chinese characters is very poor. I do not have the ability. What Jason has given, Jason and Amon has given us, is that of giving us at least a flavor of that. They also bring in a lot of the cultural context because it's the context which is important. And what did that character mean to the people who were writing it? And they bring in all of that. They bring in the layers of thinking that goes in. What are the alternative ways of thinking about this character? And how did they make the decision to interpret it, you know, to say, this is what the right meaning of it is. How did they do that? They actually talk about the process of doing that. Now, I feel very close to this because I'm trying to do something similar in Bhagavad Gita because I can read Sanskrit, not well enough to do the translation I found out, but quite well. I can understand the words and the meaning that you get when you are actually reading the original word is just very, very deep because each language has different concepts. So the concepts do not really translate. It's not like one-to-one -one mapping between concepts. Each concept itself is different. And um, the, as Amon was saying, you know, Chinese has this habit of packing so much into those individual characters. So to unpack them, it's an enormous, enormous task. And so it's really uh, amazing experience. The other part I wanted to, again, expand on what Amon was saying, just like right, the relationship between writing and speaking. Um, the best thinker on this is a guy called uh, Walter Ong. And he has written a book called Orality and Literacy. So the point is that just like Amon was saying that after writing, talking to people about it, going back and forth adds a richness for me as a reader of it. And then going and having Jason actually talk through how he did the translation and why he did all the translation adds a completely new, new level. So, so thank you very much. Folks, now it's time to ask questions about uh, translation. So um, if, if you, if Jason or Amon want to respond to anything, you're welcome to do that. Yeah. Um, okay. uh, let, let me uh, hear, hear, great to hear everybody's comments. Okay, so that's wonderful. And uh, I specifically want to respond to David, uh, Dave uh, Tacoma, okay. uh, comment about the poetry. Okay, I just want to say, at least in my, my understanding, it's not a poetry, okay? So, but again, the Chinese poetry, the concept of poetry and Western poetry are totally different, 
that's very different. Okay, so for example, Homer's, okay, the idiots, that's what, Chinese cannot imagine you guys write such a long poetry. We only write 20 characters, okay, that's a poetry. So that's a totally different concept. But I'd like to make the comment on this one is, uh, it's not a poetry, but it's a different kind of writing. Okay, you, and then my, the, 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 I, that's the biggest concern I have is how does ancient Chinese convince people? They don't use the syllogism, okay? They don't deduction, induction method. How are they convinced people? That's my big question. So when I look at this one, I find out uh, the, the way Chinese learn, okay? Probably even today, they just ask you to memorize when the kids, and they tell you, don't ask so many questions. Memorize it. When you grow up, you will understand. And generation after generation, that's proof true because you read it and when you grow up, you understand. But remember, I'm not a, don't have a good memory. So that's why I developed my, my own logical thinking. So I figure out at this moment, because the Chinese are smaller talk, so you can lay out Okay, so for example, we talk about five virtue, okay? Temperance, okay, kind, love, okay, uh, faithful. They're all in the different nets, okay? So it doesn't matter what language you are doing, you do it in Greek, to Russian, uh, French, English, German, they're all in the different nets. But Chinese are all in the same size of box. So you can lay out very nicely. That's why I start to lay out. So it looks like a bum, 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 bum. So it's kind of like something stick in your head. So, you know, they, that's, that's the way it convince you. They make a structure, okay? So that's why I like to comment on David talk about the poetry. It's a poetry structure, but not because the author uh, tried to make a poetry, poet, a poem, because that's the way to convince people. I think that's that's what I, I like to comment. Wonderful, uh, Amon. Did you have any question, uh, any comments before we go on? First of all, my Irish Catholic upbringing, which is the other half of my family, makes all the praise almost intolerable. But thank you all. Um, <laughs> and actually, I I kind of wanted to address this point too about the idea of poetry. I don't know that Jason and I actually agree on this. One of my favorite translators is Red Pine. Um, and I like his translation because I've actually met him. I've actually talked to him. And I like when he reads the classics in the original Chinese because he has this way of whether he tries to or not, he winds up singing as he reads and it just becomes a melody. He actually reads the classics as having some sort of rhythmic melodic quality that he evokes and he he said i he it's his opinion but i agree that it's reasonable that singing is one of the easiest ways for people to memorize things we all probably remember some commercial jingle from our childhood i i've still got i'd like to buy the world a coke rattling around in my head some 40 years later um, and that's because there was an understanding. This is how you can impart information in a very retainable way. The classics, a lot of them seem to, if not overtly want to be sung, there are some of them that lend themselves to that sort of recitation. And the Tao Te Ching probably is one of the preeminent ones because every line is so terse, because there is such a rhythm built in. It can be read in an almost rhythmic chant that makes it much easier to memorize, which is why I still have, you know, the original Chinese of those first two lines, Dao Ke Dao Fei Cheng Dao Ming Kong Ming Fei Cheng Ming. They just are always in there. And you know, immediately recall. Um, so yeah, I do think there is something poetic, if not intentionally meant as poetry within some of these old classics. And I can 
appreciate what he was saying about the structure could be abstracted so that it becomes evident for the non-Chinese reader. I, and I can appreciate why somebody would want to do do that. Just go over each character and, you know, give it a a variable value so that when you start seeing X, X, Y, X, X, Q, X, X, T, you start going, oh, they're getting at something here. Um, I think that's a slightly different process than a translation, but it would be an interesting addition to a translation to just to make that, you know, plainly clear for the non-Chinese speaker. Wonderful. Um, next qu question is by YJH. Go ahead. Hi, uh, I just on mute. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Oh. Hi, thank you. Uh, I hope I to keep it brief. And I am from an education educator background. So I feel like uh, people have different ways of appreciation of different things. I mean, one thing. So it's like, it's the old story, like uh, that five uh, blind people to get a feeling of what elephant looks like. Because I feel like from people's different background, they always have different uh, reflecting on what is there. And I either it's a poetic or a structure. I feel like it's different uh, people or at different stage of different your 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 experiences, uh, and then you you will appreciate different levels and different layers of understanding of the Tao Te Ching or anything else. And for myself, I'm uh, trained in science, and I really appreciate all the equations that reflect in the structure of the nature. But also when I'm learning the traditional Chinese medicine, there is always, a, also you can see a structures, not only of the, in the logic level, but also in the kind of language level, just almost like you see in Dao Te Ching. So I would say um, we can let uh, ourselves uh, being kind of free on what we try to grasp, but just accepting one layers at a time, and then not limited to that only layer to let the further days goes and maybe you will find something else whenever you see different, different times or different new experiences or different perspective or pivot. So Thank that's you. my thing. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, YJH. Uh, folks, uh, now we're going to go to the reading. Uh, Jason, if you could read uh, your nine verses, and then Amon, if you could read it, and then we will open it up for discussion again. You're on mute, Jason. Okay, so let me share my screen. Uh, just find my screen here. Okay. Am I right or not? Uh, it's still coming up. Is that is yes. that, that's a uh, chapter one? You see chapter, chapter one. Chapter one. Okay. Okay. So okay, I'm going to read it without stop. Okay. <clears throat> uh, I start to put the title on that, and I would like uh, if you can pay attention on the title and give me some suggestion or comment. That would be great. Chapter one: Being and the non-being. The Tao which can be expressed is not the unchanging Tao. The manifestation which can be named is not the unchanging manifestation. Nothingness, which is non-being, is manifested as the origin of nature. Being is manifested as the source of all things. Therefore, through the unchanging nothingness, you can observe the unobidity of the Tao. Through the unchanging beings, you can observe the subtlety of the Tao. These two, which means both nothingness and the being, being and the non-being, uh, are both from the Tao, but manifested differently. Both are profound mystery. This profound mysticism is the gate to understand all unknowns of Tao. That's the first chapter. I go to the second chapter. I call it the good and the evil. When the people of the world know what makes the beautiful beautiful, the concept of ugliness arrives. When they 
know what makes the good good, the concept of evil arise. Therefore, being and nothingness coexist in growth. Difficulty and ease coexist in completion. Longness and shortness coexist in forms. Superiority and inferiority coexist in comparison. Music and the voice coexist in harmony. Front and the back coexist in attachment. That's why the sage manage, manage work with Wu Wei, conduct teaching with no word. All things grow, with, grow without initiating from the sage, multiply without being possessed by the sage, act without depending on the sage. The successful achievement is not claimed by the sage because he never claimed it. The achievement can be long lasting. Chapter three is the Wu Wei. Chapter three, do not promote the talented so people will not contest. Do not value real goods so people will not steal. Do not show the desirables so people mind, people's mind will not be disrupted. For this reason, the governance of the sage is to empty people's minds, but fill their bellies, weaken people's volitions, but straighten their bones, which means bodies. Always keep people away from knowing and desiring. So, so those with knowledge dare not interfere. Practice Wu Wei and nothing will be ungoverned. Number four. I highlight this part, okay, because I believe this part is redundant, misplaced from different chapters. So some version, they take out this part, but some keep this one because I don't see that match. Okay, that's the reason. I, I'm not going to read this part. Uh, what is Tao? That's the uh, chapter talking about what is Tao. The Tao is like a cup that is not filled up, but functional, like a deep water which simulate the source of all things, like clear water, which seems vaguely present. I don't know who produced Tao, but I know Tao existed even before the legendary heavenly ruler. Number five, benevolence. Okay, I put a question mark. I think uh, he, uh, the author is criticized uh, the, uh, the virtue of benevolence, uh, which is Ren. Okay. Nature does not practice benevolence. Beneficence, okay. It treats all things like straw dogs. The sage do not practice beneficence. He treats all people like straw dogs. In nature, like, is nature like a big blower? It is empty, but exhaustible. The more it works, the more it produces. Too many teachings lead to exhaustion. Rather to, re, rather to remain as an empty cup. Number six, inexhaustible Tao. The undying spirit of the basin are like the profound females. The gates of the profound females are like the root of nature. Nature continuously exists and it exhaustibly functions. Number seven, selflessness. Nature endures forever. The reason nature can endure forever is that it doesn't strive for itself, so it can survive for a long time. Therefore, the sage stay behind in order to lead, forgetting himself in order to endure. Only through, self, only through selflessness can self-actualization be achieved. Number eight, the form of water. The highest form of goodness is the form of water. Water nourishes all things without striving against them. It always stays in the lowest places where most people do not want to stay. In this sense, the form of water is the closest to Tao. Lao Xiu know how to, they have seven lessons. 
One, stay in a good place. Think in good depth. Deal in good manners. Speak in good words. Govern in good orders. Work in good energies. Move in good timing. If and only if one doesn't strive against others, like uh, the form of water, then one can be free from blame. Number nine, to retire. Uh, to retire before going too far. Keep pouring water into a bowl. You'd better stop soon enough. Keep sharpening a blade. You cannot have it for a long time. Keep accumulating treasures in your house. You will invite break it. Keep showing off your achievement. You will be slandered. Now you retire before going too far. This is the Tao of heaven. Okay, that's it. Uh, Thank you. Amang, you want to show the screen or no? Or you are doing? Thank you. I Thank can you. show my screen. Okay, great. Uh, let me see here. Give me just a second. And let's see. Can you all see my screen well enough? Uh, yes. Okay, so I somewhat tongue in cheek have this title here, which is um, Woman the Ching Tan Tao De Jing. Um, it, I am a fan of the Pure Conversation School of Taoism. So I'll hold back on the commentary and simply read through. Chapter one on the Tao, being and non-being. The Tao which can be expressed is not the unchanging Tao. The manifestation which can be named is not the unchanging manifestation. Nothingness, non-being, is manifested as the origin of nature. Being is manifested as the source, mother, of all things. Therefore, through the unchanging nothingness, you can observe the unknowability of the Tao. Through the unchanging being, you can observe the subtlety of the Tao. These two of nothingness and being are both from the Tao, but manifested differently. Both are profound mystics. This profound mysticism is the gate to understanding all, all unknowns of the Tao. Chapter two, good and evil. When the people of the world know what makes the beautiful beautiful, the concept of ugliness arises. When they know what makes the good good, the concept of evil arises. For this reason, being and nothingness coexist in growth. Difficulty and ease coexist in completion. Longness and shortness coexist in forms. Superiority and inferiority coexist in comparison. Music and voice coexist in harmony. Front and back coexist in attachment. That's why the sage manages works with Wu Wei, conducts teachings, conducts teaching with no words. All things grow without initiating from the sage, multiplying without being possessed by the sage, act without depending on the sage. The successful achievement is not claimed by the sage. Because he never claims it, the achievement can be long lasting. Wu Wei, do not promote the talented so people will not contest. Do not value rare goods so people will not steal. Do not show the desirable so people's minds will not be disturbed. For this reason, the governance of the sage is to empty people's minds, but fill their bellies, weaken people's volitions, but strengthen their bones, bodies. Always keep people away from knowing and desiring, so those with knowledge dare not interfere. Practice Wu Wei, and nothing will be ungoverned. What is the Tao? The Tao is like blunt sharpness, untied tangles, harmonized light mixed dust. The Tao is like a cup which is not 
filled up but functional, like deep water, which stimulates the source of all growth, like clear water, which seems vaguely present. I do not know who produced Tao, but I know Tao existed even before the legendary heavenly ruler. Benef benefic beneficence. Nature does not practice beneficence, Ren. It treats all things like straw dogs. The sage does not practice beneficence, Ren. He treats all people like straw dogs. Is nature like a big bellow blower? It is empty, but inexhaustible. The more it works, the more it produces. Too many teachings lead to exhaustion, rather to remain as an empty cup. Inexhaustible Tao. The underlying spirits of the basins are like the profound female's sexual organ. The gates for the profound females are like the root of nature. Nature continuously exists and inexhaustibly functions. Selflessness. Nature endures forever. The reason nature can endure forever is that it does not strive for itself. Nature is selflessly for others. So it can survive for a long time. Therefore, the sage learned from the Tao of nature, the sage stays behind in order to lead, forgetting himself in order to endure. Here's the lesson for everyone. Only through selflessness, self-actualization can be achieved. Chapter eight, the form of water. The highest form of goodness is the form of water. Water is always following downward and avoids competition. Water nourishes all things without striving against them. It always stays in the lowest place where most people do not want to stay. In this sense, the form of water is close to death. There are seven lessons we can learn from the form of water about goodness in our daily lives. Thou shalt know how to stay in the good place, stay in the good place, staying at the low position, avoiding competition. Think in good depths, like an abyss, which is deep and calm. Deal in good manners. Be kind, benevolent, and humble when dealing with people like water, soft and tender. Speak in good words, trustworthy, like water whose direction is predictable. Govern in good orders, following the course like the flow of water. Work. Sorry, I've got to actually move this. There we go. Work in good energy. Water is soft but full of energy. Thus, it is capable of doing a lot of work. Move in good timing. Respond just in time, naturally, without rushing. If and only if one doesn't strive against others like the form of water, then one can be free from blame, being blameless, acting flawlessly. No fight, no blame, you will be respected. Retire before going too far. Four lessons from daily life. Keep pouring water into a bowl. You'd better stop sometime. Keep sharpening a blade. You cannot have it for a long time. Keep accumulating treasure in your house. You will invite break-ins. Keep showing off your attack achievement. You will be slandered. Advice is to, the, to rulers and everyone. Thou shalt retire before going too far. This is the Tao of heaven. Thank you. Thank you, Amon. Nale, nale. <laughs> Uh, wonderful. Uh, folks, if you'd like to uh, talk about your experience listening to these nine verses, if you have any comments of any general nature, this is the time to do it. We've got about 30 minutes. So go ahead and type exclamation mark if you would like to talk about your experience of hearing these uh, nine verses spoken, you know, recited fully. Uh, Madeline. Oh, give me just a second. I need to unmute everybody. Uh, go ahead, Madeline. 
Yes, uh, thanks, Srikant, and thank you, uh, Jason and Iman. It's been an incredible experience being part of this group. I love the etymology. I love the discussions about the characters. Uh, it brought back, actually hearing both of the translations brought back very fond memories of aspects of the discussions. Uh, one was chapter three, the word bellies, uh, which we'd had a long talk about. Um, chapter five was straw dogs. Uh, chapter nine was the blade and the treasure. And I think uh, the thing that those really brought, brought to me was that um, in general, your knowledge of life in ancient China and of what the meaning of the terms would be in Chinese culture now and also in those times has really illuminated the book because uh, it's provided so much context for everything. And so uh, I've been using the same translation since the 1970s. Um, and so it has really, it's a pretty good one. Um, it has really illuminated things for me. And also, uh, just in general, uh, to have had the, to have learned about gender issues in ancient China and uh, what, what genders are and are not in modern Chinese language and to see how gendered the translations are when the original isn't has also been incredibly illuminating. So thank you both so much and thank you Srikant for hosting this whole thing. Thank you, thank you, Madeline. Um, anybody else would like to comment on the translations? So, I mean, uh, let's start with Joe. Joe, go ahead. Yes, um, I mean, as I was going through them, I was actually trying to look back and forth to uh, the five set of five translations uh, that we have uh, on our website. Um, and what I'm really, the one thing I was really kind of struck by is just how much more succinct and clear your translations are versus the ones that I'm reading that are just kind of striving to capture imagination. Uh, that was something that was really kind of, and it really, this just highlights what I was saying a little bit earlier in that it really adds a lot to me personally um, because I start to see, okay, what it actually means. And then, you know, then I can start to just really, uh, it gives me a lot more to walk away with. So I appreciate that as I went through um, each one of these, I just would read. And, and the themes, you could still see the themes that people have, but you could see how far they deviate from the themes and how uh, succinct you're, you are. So I think it's excellent. Wonderful. I mean, the, the biggest impression that I got, because I was just trying to compare the translation as a whole with the translations that I've read. Um, and the thing that I got from it was that this is very earthy and this is very kind of physical, you know, like right. very closely tied to physical things. So I can almost see things uh, far more clearly as opposed to being more abstract. Uh, so I, 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 I got that that impression. Next up is going to be Brian followed by Cheng. Brian. The uh, listening to the nine as opposed to the one, it struck me that uh, each one does have value on its own and can stand on alone. It is worth discussion alone. So I like the fact that we're doing that uh, in general. That really has helped a lot. Uh, the second thing is I do remember uh, some of the things, or let, let me put it differently. The first impression I had in hearing it again is that some of this is becoming clear to me. At least one view of these things is becoming clear to me. Whereas in the first, uh, the first time I went through it, it was, it was a fog. So um, that's, you know, I, I really am grateful for that. Uh, at the same time, there are things that, you know, I go through and I say, oh, 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 that, you know, I, that, that I can give that some kind of sense right now when I couldn't in the past. And then there's still other things I think, uh, I need to go over that part again. So 
there's uh it's it's really a, a kind of a very i don't know puzzling uh perplexing but uh satisfying text it's really fascinating writing thank you thank you brian next up is Jen. oh go, go ahead uh, penny sorry about that go ahead yeah that's okay i just i just thought i would say too because i actually joined the group a little bit later so most of these it's the first time that i've actually seen them read and uh but it was you know some of them i know they have been discussed in other talking about other um chapters and uh have referred back but i was i was intrigued because a lot of the the concepts you start to see the concepts which we have discussed later but i'm seeing there in in the beginning ones and i think as um as brian had alluded to too at, at the beginning when i read them i kind of read them and i thought oh okay um but it did, you know, I, I wasn't quite, you know, you read the words, but you didn't really understand what it was trying to say. And now it, it's coming together, you know, a lot more succinctly and, you know, beginning to, to have meaning. So I thought it was interesting to, to see them, but to understand a lot of it already. Thank you. Thank you, Penny. Next up is Jeng followed by Joe. Jeng. Yeah, so, <clears throat> Yeah, this is, I was trying to join the strategy because I was try, really trying to learn, but uh, unfortunately I couldn't make all the meetings, but this is really helpful, I think, when we read all three together. What I really like the translation is because we have both English and Chinese, and then I tried to read that again, you know, I was looking at the Chinese translation, but I look at English, like uh, all over the Jane, place. could you move the mic closer to your mouth? Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, maybe I just, is it better? Yeah, go go ahead. Go ahead. Maybe I should just do okay. Sorry. Maybe I shouldn't do this. Yeah, that's that's sorry, good. Sorry, yeah, okay. there's the mic. Yeah. Is okay. it better? Yeah, that's better. Go ahead. Okay, good. So <laughs> I'm not used to this vehicle. Anyway, so I found this um because you know I think it's such a great combination, Jason and Amal, because Jason has this great understanding about what the Chinese really means. But then Amal can actually make it English work so well because I found my recent email about the new watch and there's no Chinese. They're like, oh no, you know, like this perfect combination is so hard to achieve because then people actually know English so well, they cannot really understand Chinese. So I think this is perfect. I wish I could get a copy. Is it possible you can share the copy? You know, with us? Yeah, I, I really, I think this all come together makes so much more sense. I joined a couple of meetings here and there, but then they all come together. It makes so much sense when we read all together. I uh, really appreciate all your guys' work. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Jeng. Next up is Joe. So this might be a little bit my uh, lack of knowledge in the area, so forgive me. Um, but one of the things that I didn't see that you both had was the concept of Ren. And I thought that was strictly like a, a, a Confucian kind of concept, not necessarily in the Tao. So how did you arrive at is in the, your translations? Um, you talk about the chapter five, the straw dog argument? Yes, yes. Okay, actually he, uh, I, the trans actually, uh, so your question is how does how did yeah I, I didn't see I don't see it in any of my translations. Uh, oh, in your translation, yeah, a lot yeah. of translation doesn't use this one because okay, I think this one was to a little bit explanation, run okay, but nevertheless or humanness or kindness right. that's the core of Confucius teaching. Okay, so here. He is criticized uh, Confucius teaching. Okay, the run. Okay, that's the use of the word run. Okay, he's criticized Confucius teaching. The reason is run is bias, right? If I am nice to you, I'm not that nice to the other people. Uh, you have no way to let's like, say like, uh, general love. I'm biased. I love everybody, like my father or my enemy. They all the same. There's no way. So. 
Lao Zi, Dao De Zhen is criticized this kind of virtue, okay? Because you have idea of Ren, then you make some people, you will treat other people not so nice. So the best way is to stay away. So he talk about like the heaven. He never care, okay? Here's an earthquake, here's a flood, here's a, a sun, sunrise, he doesn't care. They go by itself, okay? Treat the, the world like a straw dog. Straw dog is the, uh, in the ancient time, they use the straw to make a dog so to sacrifice, which means I don't care, right? I just make it, have to sacrifice, I throw it away. That's it. So same as the sage, also doing the same way to the uh, people because the real sage should not be like Confucius sage. They be run to all the people. You should be not care, let people alone. That's the Taoist teaching. It's very against the Confucius. And then that, that's why it's very difficult to translate for most the English translator and even the Chinese interpreter. You know, most of the Chinese scholars are Confucian. So they try not to, okay, talk too much about this one. So I believe, that's a personal belief. I believe the book is written after Confucius, much later time, okay? Even historical account talk about the Lao Tzu is older than Confucius and Confucius even try to learn something from Lao Tzu. But I believe this book probably written after Confucius, okay? People just predated. Okay. So you will see a lot of subtle criti critique on the Confucius teaching. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Jason. All right, so we got about 15 minutes left. So firstly, I want to open it up for uh, Amon or Jason, if you wanted to make any comments uh, at a high level. Um, yeah, actually, I did wanna say that one nice thing about doing this evening and doing this, the sort of prep for this, and I've said this before, but I've not done sort of I've either done the really sort of 30,000 foot view of looking at all of the Tao Te Ching or doing this deep investigation, but uh, Sorry, there is a problem with your sound. Uh, just a second, your sound has suddenly stopped. Uh, let me see, is there any? Guys, can you hear him? No, right? No, there's some problem with that. There we go. Can everyone yep. hear me? Yes. My earbud died. I'm sorry about that. Um, <clears throat> more tersely, either reading the entire Tao Te Ching or doing it chapter by chapter, it seems like a lot of times there's never been this sort of bite-sized chunk. And I just went through to look with these first nine chapters. Is there a reoccurring theme that's being driven at? And there is, I don't know how deeply like inculcated to Chinese culture somebody has to be to see the overriding message of yin, just again and again and again. Mystery, emptiness, emptiness, the female, water, no enough. These are all yin qualities. And so chapter nine, really is sort of, I, I almost picked are the first nine chapters, really is sort of grabbing the student and shaking them to say, forget everything you know about how you're supposed to learn. This is the way you're supposed to learn. There is a yin way for you to learn and it is yielding and it is following and it is submissive and it is receptive. Um, I think that really comes through when you read these together, that these are the lessons, the subtext to the text is not just what each chapter is trying to tell somebody, but what it's telling to a student. This is the better way to be. This is the better way to understand things. Um, that's kind of what I was hoping to extract from something like this when you suggested doing it. Um, the other thing I wanted to say was just thank you all. Um, I'm tickled that you are as enamored with this text as I have been for years. So um, yeah, that, that's yeah. really all. So I, I want to say a couple of things uh, on that. I mean, 
we are doing this, uh, Amon, we are doing this parallel reading of Tao Te Ching, Gospel of John, and Bhagavad Gita. And the inspiration for doing this, do, doing kind of nine at a time, came from us doing Gospel of John. Actually, what I'm doing is that the beautiful thing about all these three works that is that they're extremely short. Like at the in the audio version, you can listen to them in under two hours, about two hours each. That's it. And it's an incredible experience. I find I do this many times. I find that listening to them as a whole, you start to see patterns that you do not get by just diving in. The, the, the yin pattern that you're talking about, it, it's the same thing happens at a large level when you keep listening to them as a whole. So we did a meetup on Gospel of John. It was a five hour meetup. I thought it would be three hours or four hours, but it turned out to be five hours. But incredible because you see patterns, they are all fresh in your mind. The previous patterns are fresh. So you start making patterns on the top of patterns. It's incredible. So I, at some point, I want to do the same thing with Tao Te Ching. I finally reached a point where I'm able to do that for Bhagavad Gita. I can read, I can listen to the whole thing in one and still get something from it. I'm, I'm, I'm able, to, able to do that. So I, I look forward to doing a session where we try to cover either whole of Tao Te Ching or maybe in divided into two parts. What do you, what do you think, Amon, of that idea? I think it could be done either way, but I do think the structure of the text itself lends itself to two parts, the Tao part and then the the part, which would be the first 40 and the last 40. <laughs> okay, let's do that. Uh, Jason, what do you think about the idea? Um, I think I kind of agree with Amon, but uh, since you only have a 5,000 character, so, you know, we, we probably can read out loud, you know, to, uh, from the beginning to the end and uh, then see what's going on, you know. So that's, that's another way to think about it, yeah. So uh, I think we are doing the thing very different from the traditional, I talk about the Chinese tradition, okay, how to read this one, you know. Uh, yeah, please, please elaborate on that. Well, how is it done traditionally and how are we doing it differently? Uh, well, tradition, it's a long tradition, so we, the, the 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 way people studied it evolved okay so um depend on the time and then i just only can i can talk about in my time okay the school is not teaching this okay so but people know about this okay because in the some commentary people will quote one line or two line that's how being used okay because most of people i believe if i'm in taiwan now uh, I ask most of the people in Taiwan, or I go to the college, let's say the Taiwan Univers National Taiwan University, makes all the students, whether or not you read the whole book, I don't know, probably less than 5% wow. read the book, okay? But if you pick up some sentences, let's say Dao Ke Dao, okay? Everybody know, okay? Some other say some people may know a lot of sentences. I remember when I tried to uh, go past, uh, take the exam for the graduate school, Okay, even in the engineering, but uh, they still have to test your Chinese writing. So the, they ask you to write a composition. Okay, they say they, they use the, the, the one of the sentence here. I forget in which chapter they mean if you want to go thousand miles, start from your first step. Okay, that's from that one. And unfortunately, most of the students doesn't know this sentence. They know this meaning, but they don't know this one is from Tao Te Ching. I know, okay, I knew, so I do it well, okay. So uh, so I think that's the way people do it. And if I have to bring back to the traditional, I they, they it's not in the standard training, okay, the Confucian training. People just read it on the like uh, complementary, okay. So it never been in the center, okay of in the academic work. So that's, that's I have to comment on that, yeah. Okay, um, one last question. Um, I mean, after Tao Te Ching, I'm thinking of taking up Zhuangzi. I'm not pronouncing it correctly, but that's, that's what many, many people have recommended to me. What, what, what do you guys think? Amon, what do you think? I love Zhuangzi. Zhuangzi is actually, 
some of the most enjoyable um, Chinese classic literature. And it is very much a companion piece to the Tao Te Ching. Um, it's a little misleading in the sense that people think Zhuangzi follows Lao Tzu. Zhuangzi was inspired by Lao Tzu, no, no doubt about it. But there are things that work in that version of Taoism that are more strident, I want to say sometimes, though his writing is much more humorous. Lao Tzu kind of points at funny ideas every once in a while. Zhuangzi will lay them out for you. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, Jason, what do you think about Zhuangzi? Okay, uh, Zhuangzi, I think that's the best uh, work to introduce to the Western. If you read uh, Nietzsche's uh, The Spoke Zalarustra, okay, that would be, I will say that's the Chinese version of Zalarustra, okay. There's a lot of story on it. And I read Zalarustra and I find out, oh, come on, that's the same, okay. And then the good, the, the reason I think this one is a lot of literature writing, okay. When you translate it to English, it lost the beautifulness, okay. Mm -hmm. But Zhuangzi is different. It's beautiful, not only in its word, also beautiful in its thought. So this mental beautifulness, you can translate to English. It still keep its beauty on that. So I think that, that would be wonderful to read. And I have been thinking about to run in this program, but I haven't had a chance, I haven't had a guts to do it. My idea is doing this. Do you have a first hour reading in Chinese and you mark it on the uh, uh, Chinese speaking society. So people read in Chinese and the second hour you read in English. Okay, so that's the idea I've been thinking for a long time, but I just need some way or somehow to start. That's we'll the figure thing. out. Yeah, we'll figure out the format, but I definitely want to oh, go ahead. Uh, just... One more I thing I'd like to suggest is if we want to keep the same format, we are doing reading the translation and doing this. I'm very interested to read the Analect, okay? The uh, Confucius the Analect. First, Zhuangzi is too long, okay? And then uh, I don't think I will be able to translate the Zhuangzi by myself. It's a humongous work. And then Confucius uh, Analect is only has a 10,000 character, so it's durable. And then if you are reading this book and the compare to another, that's a good comparison. You will see how the writing different, how the idea different. Mm -hmm. They are in the same time to during of the warring state. Okay, how are they provide different idea to solve the same problem? Okay. I would say, Jason, um, the seven inner chapters that are generally attributed to Zhuangzi, the others are attributed to later writers very often, but just focusing on those seven, you could probably get that in a much tighter frame. I'm not suggesting you translate anymore. <laughs> you do all the work you want to do, but um, it would be interesting to at least tackle the seven inner chapters as a companion piece to the Tao Te Ching but as far as cultural impact goes, I think you're right that Confucian analects are both, they're a good foil to what we've been studying in, with the Tao Te Ching and with Taoism, but they're also much more prevalent within the greater zeitgeist of Chinese thought. And so to appreciate these, what we would view as conflicting ideas that exist harmoniously in China for thousands and thousands of years might not be a bad way to go about it. But we have 20 chapters to go before we have to really Absolutely. decide. So it, it's, I, I like to make plans uh, because I, I think what we're doing is that we are running, you know, the way I'm seeing it is that it's the West, India and China. We're trying to study them in parallel on their own terms and then slowly seeing the connections, you know, similarities and differences. If you um, want to understand China, the analects are definitely a profound yeah. insight. I'm yeah, I'm I'm thinking more in that direction because then we can come back to uh, Zhuangzi after analects, 
Um, so we, because it's like, it's like yin yang, right? You, you have Taoism and Confucianism. Uh, and it's you good, can't really understand China without both of them, really. Huang is a good palate cleanser too. Just to paraphrase uh, what you'd be looking at, one of my favorite quotes is something to the effect of, uh, fish traps are for catching fish. Once you've caught the fish, you disregard the trap. Rabbit snares are for catching rabbits. When you catch the rabbit, you disregard the snare. Words are for catching ideas. Once you cut the idea, you can let go of the words. Where is a man who's forgotten all the words? Because he's the man I want to have a word with. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. All right, folks, on that note, thank you. Thank you, Amon, and thank you, Jason. This was delightful. I will see you next time. Bye. You do weekly. What's that? Do you want to do it weekly? I'm happy to do it weekly. Um, <laughs> we will we'll we'll figure it out. Uh, okay. Let's let's work on the schedule. Okay. Okay. I I would love to do that. Uh, we can look at it uh, and let, let's work out in terms of how much because I want to combine that with the idea of reading kind of sizable parts. Okay. Of it so people. You can guys think about this. I will try and be here again. Don't expect to see me dressed if it's on a Tuesday, but I I will try and make it for these. I've enjoyed it. It's all right well. all right so that that's an added added ad advantage of <laughs> Amon, it's Amon's, yeah a month of you know visual visual avatar as opposed to upside down avatar wonderful thank you thank you <laughs> <laughs> love it love it all bye. right bye Allah. <laughs> bye everybody <laughs> see you thank you